Welcome again to the Alan Turing Institute's third um, uh, lecture series um, here in the British Library, which is our, our home. We've been here since about October, and we are preparing some new space, which will be the home of the Alan Turing Institute for the next three or four years. As you know, it's a new institute of data science, the National Institute for Data Science, and uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to, the, to, uh, to this seminar event. Now, our, our first speaker is Professor Luciano Floridi, who uh, I'm delighted to welcome. He comes from Oxford, where he works at the Oxford Internet Institute, and he is the Professor of Philosophy and the Ethics of Information there, which is not a kind of professor that everybody has. Uh, before that, just to show consistency, he was Professor of Information and Computer Ethics at the University of Hertfordshire, so he's um, doing this kind of thing multiple times. He's also had posts at the University of Bari and at the Warburg Institute and also the University of Warwick. Um, his long-term project, he says, is a um, tetralogy on the philosophy of information. And as far as I can see, he's just written the fifth book in his tetralogy, which came out in, in uh, 2014. He's a fellow of the British Computer Society. He's won uh, numerous prizes, uh, including being named the Gauss Professor, which uh, sounds particularly splendid. He's in very great demand um, as a speaker, and so I'm very happy that uh, he's been able to make time to come and speak to us here. He's also going to be one of our new um, faculty fellows. We're about to announce um, uh, our faculty fellows drawn from the five member universities of the Alan Turing Institute, um, Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, Edinburgh, and Warwick. Um, but um, without um, uh, going on any longer, I'm very happy to, to welcome him to present his lecture on ethics in the age of information. Thank you, Luciano. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the tetralogy thing wasn't my idea. Uh, it's an uh, Oxford way of talking. Uh, they say, well, it's four books, so it has to be a tetralogy. Um, um, I'm here as a, as a faculty member, uh, so that's what uh, you should remember uh, of the Alan Turing Institute. And it's a, it's a privilege uh, to be here. Uh, it doesn't happen every day that you uh, start together with such an uh, exciting enterprise from the very beginning. Um, there's also a risk. Uh, now, if you join an institute that has been there for thousands of years, uh, then you can al always blame the thousands of years before you. Whereas if you join from day one, if something doesn't work properly, well, people will look at you and say, uh-uh, you were there from day one. <laughs> so why it didn't work uh, the way it should have? So a bit of a challenge, but excitement. Now, when uh, we put together the program for uh, this uh, uh, afternoon, I thought I could give you a bit of a, a two uh, um, lectures in one. Uh, don't worry, it will be 45 minutes. Um, but in a sense, uh, discuss with you um, what happens not just when you have the dish in front of you at the restaurant, but also what happens in the kitchen. Now, uh, as the Germans uh, used to say, you don't want to know how we make sausages. Uh, yes, you don't want to know how you, know, how you do the ethics. Uh, you just want to know, know how the ethics works. But this is the context where we are going to make the sausages, where we are going to do the, the ethics for the new information age. So I thought that a bit of both, a bit of um, a taste of the dish and a look at the kitchen would uh, help. And with that analogy, I, let's start with some wine. Uh, I hope it's not too far away from you. Um, the wine analogy here is to explain two things uh, very quickly so that we do some real work. First of all, you might have had a taste of a terrible wine in the past, and then you have been drinking beer ever since. You know, that cheap, horrible wine that we used to drink when we were undergraduates. Um, now, philosophy and ethics is a bit like that. You might have been exposed to some philosophy or ethics and decided never again. That's, that's disgusting. So hopefully we're going to open a good bottle of wine. So bear with me if you have seen something terrible uh, in the past. Uh, the reason why you're here is that probably you want to have a, at least a second taste. Uh, so that's a good chance. But also the analogy with wine uh, connects with something else, which is 
when it comes to wine, anybody is an expert. I don't know if you have a friend, one of those friends, who start talking about wine and uh, they haven't got a clue. In fact, you actually made a mistake and you gave them the table wine and it was in the kitchen, but it's too late to tell them and they start talking about the bouquet, the color and this and that. Now, talking about wine doesn't mean knowing what wine is. Now, I've learned enough to shut up when it comes to wine. I don't say a word, I just enjoy it. Uh, now, ethics is a bit like that. Uh, the other analogy I had in mind was with sex, but I thought it wasn't appropriate. Anybody knows what he's doing um, and now it gives you advice. Uh, not really. Uh, I mean, like wine, uh, there's expertise and you know when you meet it, and there's the talking about the stuff. Now, the talking is uh, just knowing the vocabulary and blathering something independently of whether you actually know the stuff or not. So hopefully, no, we're going to open uh, a bit of a, a good wine and have a taste of the real thing. Now, I said a look at the kitchen and a look at the uh, dish. This is the list, and you shouldn't be able to see uh, two to seven. Um, the list of things I would like to cover today with you. The first half, uh, which will not take the first half of the time, um, is really a framework. And within that framework, I hope to tell you things that you know by heart. So if you feel that you know exactly what I'm talking about, that's a good thing. Because I, all I want to do is to remind you and put the things in the right order. So if it is a story that you know, resonates with you, fantastic. That is the information revolution. Then is a bit of time, understood as hyperhistory. Space, understood as infosphere. And the human nature, how has this changed in a time that is hyperhistorical, in a space that is made of information, namely the fourth revolution. With that, we finally get into uh, outside uh, the uh, sort of uh, restaurant, inside the kitchen, and uh, I shall tell you more about one particular issue within that context. So think in terms of framework, lots of issues within that framework. In the second half, we're going to address only one, because I wanted to give you a bit of a sense of what it means to work for real, as opposed to you know, general uh, ideas all the time. And that will be the infraethics idea. Now, all these words should not ring a bell at all and uh, they will be explained when uh, uh, I come to the point. A quick conclusion and um, Q&A. So this is something that you've seen a thousand times, and we start with a framework. It's the dish in front of you uh, in the restaurant. More slow, um, amazing growth of processing power. I won't waste any time on this because uh, I know you know. I'll tell you more about that in a moment, but at the moment, no, that's all we need to uh, focus on. This is slightly more interesting. You may not have seen this as a picture. The, the other one was kind of a Mona Lisa of our time. This is a little bit less of a Mona Lisa. It's more like a, a, a late Renaissance kind of thing. Um, it's how little everything uh, would cost uh, here. Now, if you look at the uh, top uh, uh, left, uh, that's uh, normally a number that nobody can read. Um, and it's, uh, trillions and gazillions of millions of dollars that the processing power on your old iPad would cost around uh, mid-40s uh, if you could have bought that. That's more than the GDP of a whole country. We all know this. We just need to realize that increasing processing power, decreasing cost, which leads to a lot of things in the world being able to process information. Again, I know that you know about maybe just to focus on something every second, and by the time I started this uh, lecture, there have been a lot of seconds, we produce in the world 13 trillion transistors every second that it takes to say the sentence. There have been another 13 trillion transistors out there. We are doing something with that stuff. We're generating a lot of information, a lot of data. Now, the growth of data, this is uh, something that I uh, borrowed from uh, last conference from, uh, I, I did with Cisco. Uh, suppose that Cisco is wrong by far, that we didn't move from 4.4 to 44 because those numbers are a little bit too symmetric for my taste. Um, no, nice, but suppose they're really wrong by, say, 10, 20, 30 percent. It's still staggering. Now, 90 um, percent of, of all that has been generated in the last two years. Um, most of it has been generated by us. Only 1% according to Cisco, but I have a reason to say that. It's been actually used by business for a different purpose for which it had been collected in the first place. But even if they are wrong by far, this is still staggering. And by the way, one note, we won't come back to this. Those data have been created all together. It's a baby boom expecting us. They are all getting too old together. We kind of come into a threshold of aging, aging of the support, the physical stuff, the seven 
years, roughly speaking, that your DVD you know, CD used to last. Well, this stuff is physical and it has a best before. And it's all coming all together like a tsunami. Uh, is anyone thinking about it? But let's uh, focus on the positive side, kind of. This tsunami is growing and it will be growing. Uh, the only limits we have here is physics, the actual physics, storage, and intelligence hours. Uh, and to my extent, no, the best of, of my understanding, the only one available in the universe. Now, um, in case anyone thought about uh, um, uh, intelligent design. Now, let me tell you just two things quickly on physics and storage, and then we start getting a little bit closer to something new. This is uh, uh, what The Economist published uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the top blue line, that's roughly how much uh, the transistor per chip have been uh, growing. The light blue line in the middle is actually the clock speed of your computer. It has not been growing as quickly as the number of transistors. And the gray line below, that's actually physics. It means that there's a limit below which is not safe to run that transistor, which means that we just hitting the wall. That is the end, so to speak, of Moore's generalization, or Moore's law, as is known. So we are coming to an age where just doubling the transistors on, on a chip is no longer a solution. We need to find different ways of increasing the processing power of our machines. This is an open line of research, not for today, but is an interesting uh, idea. Remember, I also said not physics, but also storage. Nobody actually knows I did some research in the last week, exactly how much storage capacity we're producing in the world. The different, not that nobody knows, but the different sort of statistics. The last one that I found that was reliable comes again from The Economist. If you can see it uh, far away, there's a sort of uh, uh, bifurcation of two lines. The dark one going up is how much data we're producing <coughs> in our world. Remember, this is an old stuff. Uh, now, anything um, past 2009 is a prediction for those guys. But since 2007, we have not produced enough storage space. It says, so what? Well, it means that the hard disk of the world is not big enough for everything you want to put in it. Namely, what happens in my phone happens on a world scale. Something comes in, something has to be erased or something should have never been recorded in the first place. These two things, nothing recorded or something deleted because something else gets recorded, that's a strategy. It's a strategy that we are just implementing as we speak. It's, you know, if you speak to the uh, uh, librarians around the corner, they know that this is a dangerous step to take unless you have thought about it and what goes and what stays. You talk to industry and they might say, oh, every five years we, we clean everything, we throw everything away. And they say, oh, only six years ago, we had all those precious data we really wanted to have, etc. So lots of uh, interesting things in terms of uh, uh, gap. All this, you might have understood, comes with lots of problems. Acquisition and storage, usability, security and safety, accessibility, analytics, law and ethics, and bottom line, dollars. Because everything you do above that costs something. Now, all these problems are not for today apart from the ethics where we want to look at the kitchen, as I said. But remember, for every entry there, there is a whole university course and research projects and libraries of research that has been done uh, on top of it. So this is just a reminder. Uh, I know you know, and nothing should be terribly new in all this, apart from the usual wow effect. Processing power going up, costs going down, lots of data. So what happens to our time. Well, our time, uh, we used to think that um, uh, history was coming to an end, if you remember the famous book. Uh, not really. Um, so you can uh, build the following picture here. Uh, on the one hand, the prehistory. Prehistory is, if you pick up uh, a textbook from uh, uh, any university course, will tell you that prehistory is any stage of uh, a society that doesn't have, that society, any way of recording the present for future consumption. Is biological memory. If you know that recipe, that recipe has been passed on to you by your grandmother, no, verbally, because it's not written anywhere. So about 6,000 years ago, we invented writing uh, here and in China, and we moved from prehistory to history. There are still uh, places in the world that live prehistorically, just a few villages in the middle of the Amazonian environment, uh, apparently not having a way of recording anything as we speak. They're disappearing. 
essentially the whole world has moved finally as a block to a historical time. Now, in prehistory, therefore, there is no ICT, no information and communication technologies. In history, you have individual and social well-being related to ICT. There is no Egyptian, there is no Athens, there is no Rome, there is no British Empire, there is no nothing unless you can write things down. At least the laws, to mention one thing. And if you really want to write down who is who and you run a census, well, next thing you know, that couple has to travel from there to there and they have a baby. Uh, that is going to uh, end up in a place no, that uh, no, nobody had actually predicted, apart from the Bible, that would end up there. So the state is running the, uh, the, the game as the information agent. Now, what happens to us? Well, this dependency has become increasingly important. It's not just a relation that we have. We have, as it were, been sitting more and more substantially on this huge infrastructure, which is ICT, meaning that we actually are turning the screw of history tighter, not looser, and therefore we're moving to something you call hyperhistory. If you think that this is too much philosophy for you, um, uh, hopefully nobody here is from uh, the cybersecurity center, because they know exactly why we live in a hyperhistorical world. We live, you know that you live in a hyperhistorical society if that society can be put on its knees by a cyber attack, meaning that their society depends so much on their infrastructure that there is the Achilles no, point uh, where that society can be attacked. Now, this will not happen to the Taliban in Afghanistan because they don't live in a hyperhistorical society. They couldn't care less you know, by a cyber attack of that sort, but it happens to us. So, what happened? Well, because of this incredible transformation, you have things like cyber culture, posthumanism, singularity, this is all science fiction and could be disregarded as pointless uh, discussions if you went for the fact that this is like the temperature of a sickness behind. So it's like saying, we're scratching there. We think that there's something going on and we need to understand. It doesn't matter that these are mistakes or things that are not very uh, fruitful. We do need a new philosophy of nature because nature has changed dramatically. We do need a philosophical anthropology of different kind because our self-understanding is changing. We need a new political philosophy because, of course, no, and uh, Helen, uh, see, so I'm embarrassed to mention this, uh, but of course, no, things have changed dramatically on the political and social side. Unfortunately, we're also witnessing in this new hyperhistorical time a new cultural dualism. Not here and not at the Oxford Internet Institute, but elsewhere, you must have uh, no, bump into that thing like, oh, we do the data, we don't care about the information. We care about patterns, or we care about meanings. We care about syntax, no, we care about semantics. Quantitative, qualitative. Now that divide, which you know, would be terrible if you were to become permanent, is the new sort of two cultures that we are witnessing today. This institute, as far as I'm concerned, and the one we have in Oxford, is you know, the good force fighting and bridging that gap. But there are other forces that are pulling things away, uh, and that will not be a solution for the future. So that's as far as time is concerned. What about space? Well, I reminded you about all those uh, transistors and the power going up and the cost going down and all the data. So I needed to do that in order to introduce uh, no, Italian here, after all. That's where I come from, Galileo. Well, Galileo has this beautiful uh, picture about the world, and it's kind of famous among philosophers. It says, the book of nature is written in mathematical language. You can read the rest. And therefore, you need to have the tools to understand their language. Otherwise, you know, you're completely lost. Let's pick that up for a moment. The book of nature, written in mathematical symbols. The next thing you'll wonder is um, this nature outside, this world, this universe, written in mathematical symbols. What happens when you start having the digital world? Well, the digital is not a way of describing necessarily the world, but it's not a way of telling the world how it should go, is, using a, a quick word in English, is inscribing new pages, or if you allow me the, the simplification, new chapters in the Book of Nature. No, the Book of Nature is written in mathematical symbols. Well, then, when you are developing digital technology, you're adding more to that Book of Nature. So this adding more and wrapping the Book of Nature in uh, a digital format, that's what is the new space in front of us? That's the infosphere. And if you think that that's, again, a bit too philosophical, back to the engineering stuff. What you see there is um, uh, uh, enveloping, uh, as they say in uh, mechanical engineering, is um, the space, the 3D space, where a robot is successfully uh, operating. 
So if you want to, say, spray a car in your particular context, you don't unleash a robot in the world and say, could you please you know, color that car red? And say, no, no, let me build a whole environment within which you, robot, can be successful. That is called an envelope. So what's happening to our space? Now, we are essentially, with 13 trillion uh, little sort of uh, things uh, being produced every second and all those zettabytes of stuff and uh, costs going down and power going up, etc., we are enveloping the world. We are transforming the world into this huge infosphere where then machines can be successful. So if anyone comes to you and says, normally a journalist, says, oh my goodness, they're artificial intelligence, they're going to cope with the world better than us. No, we have and we are transforming the world in such a way as to, for them to be able to cope with it. Example, so just in case, this is what we're doing now. Uh, we are transforming the simple abilities of a robot, no, washing machine, we build a whole box around it. Uh, computer scientists, when they want to be fancy, they talk about an ontology around the robot, but that's what it is, the box. This is the mistake. We think that we are going to produce robots that, like us, do the dishes like us. Not really, that's not the way forward. Maybe, maybe not, but the future is more like what I want for Christmas. Because at the moment, I'm the interface between the kitchen and the envelope space. I'm the one who has to put the dishes inside the dishwasher. Uh, literally, I'm glad that we are not being on record on this, uh, just in case you know, someone else at home you know, needs to be told. Uh, so for Christmas, uh, uh, I want to have this robot that puts the dishes inside the machine. And this is the future. It's a future where the robot that can cook has transformed the whole kitchen in an envelope for the robot. Look at the gentleman outside the space. It has to be outside because that space is no longer meant for him or for her. It's meant for the robot, which then, having all this envelope around, will be successful in operating over there. More philosophy, well, more practical stuff. This comes from uh, uh, Eurostat, and um, it's a bit old. Is the most recent uh, statistics we have about how people have access to the internet on the move away from home and work. And the next question you want to ask is that, where the heck are they? Now, they're not home, they're not at work, and they are online anyway, because they never leave the dishwasher. We never leave the dishwasher. We always, no, at least, no, 27% of us, 500 million in uh, Europe, always within the envelope. So more historically, this was how grandma used to do computing. Uh, it was a screwdriver uh, kind of uh, enterprise. She would walk inside the computer, then her daughter walk outside of the computer, and the computer became something in front of her eyes. Her granddaughter has walked inside again. And in fact, it, she's so much inside that she doesn't even know that she's inside the computer. We don't even perceive the fact that we are in this big dishwasher. We live on life now. There's no point in asking whether you are online and offline, as I used to do you know, in the 90s. Uh, so, you know, driving you know, with a GPS, are you online or offline? You must be someone from the 90s uh, you know, to ask that question. So, uh, welcome to the new millennium. So what happens in this um, no, dishwasher, in this envelope uh, space, in the infosphere, that we are joined by a lot of other agents that talk to each other. Again, this is Cisco, um, so uh, with uh, a pinch of salt, but roughly between 2003 and 2010, we uh, overstepped the, the boundary where there were more connected devices than people. By the time, if you can read up uh, uh, to the right-hand side, by the time we are 7.6 billion, namely 2020, there will be about 50 billion gadgets talking to each other. Which means that uh, if you are an anthropologist from Mars wanting to discuss communication on this planet, human communication in terms of quantity is negligible. And it will be increasingly negligible. All the talking is done by machine to machine. That is the same data uh, with the different graphics, and that's how it looks once you make it to 100. We are quickly disappearing. So that this was the past. Wikipedia was written there for us, for our eyes. This is the present. Uh, Wikipedia is not written there anymore because it's not written for us, for our eyes. It's like pretending that you know, all those uh, uh, barcodes were for humans. Of course they're not, uh, for machines. So lots has happened in terms of information revolution. Uh, time has become hyper-historical, space has become an infosphere. What about us? Well, we used to think that we were at the center of the universe. With Copernicus, we gave up that. Uh, then we 
retrench and we thought, well, we are at least at the center of the biological game. And uh, of course, that had also had to be given up uh, thanks to Darwin. So we retrenched once more and we thought, well, okay, we're not at the center of the universe. We're not that important. And we're not at the center of the biological game. We're not that important on this planet either. But at least we are at the center of mental life. We know exactly what's going on in our minds. The mind is like a, a shoebox. You open it, you see what's going on, you close it. And in fact, Descartes has pretty much not a shoebox, but uh, a basket of apples. Thought are uh, like apples. You check each of them, and those that are not good enough, you throw them away, and then you refill the basket with the good apples. Citation from Descartes. Well, Freud came and says, I'm sorry, you're not at the center of that mental game either. So you have to give up also that centrality in terms of total awareness and rationality and transparency. What has happened, and this is the right place where to say this, we retrench in a way, and that's, you, know, you can summarize this in you know, 60 or 70 years of debate about AI. Well, at least we are the smart agents. No, nobody can play chess like us. Nah. Nobody can fly this airplane from here to there like us. Nah. Nobody can play Go. Nah. <laughs> so nobody can, and no, there are books written by colleagues in California, what computers can't do, second edition, what computers still can't do, third edition, not printed. <laughs> because what computers can't do is not a strategy. They can, and they can better than us. The problem is that they have just shifted our self-perception. Now, who are we if we're not the cab driver? Who are we if not the guy who can park this car there in the right place? Who am I if I, if, uh, I cannot win you know, a question and answers game like uh, Jeopardy? Who am I if you know, my iPhone beats me at chess, no, like with no, one eye closed, as it were. So we are reshuffling that in terms of our information on nature, and we are trying to understand that as we speak. So that's what the ethics of all this is now start biting. Because once you start talking about human nature, who we are, who we should be, how we should interact with each other, what kind of institution we should build, well, that is ethics, capital E, has always been, at least on this corner of the universe for the past 25 centuries. No, from Socrates onwards. What exactly in terms of today? I'll give you here a quick summary, and I think it's too far for many of you, so let me read it aloud, just to give you a sense, and then we finally dive into something specific. The green part on top, the general problems. Something about a post-Westphalian order. Peace of Westphalia, finally all Europeans get together and say, you know, let's do this. Uh, your place, your rules, my place, my rules. And we stop killing each other for a long time. Until someone thought, no, 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 my place, my rules, your place, my rules, and we started again. World War I, and then we started again, World War II. And then we went back to the original point. So, okay, your place, your rules, my place, my rules. That's you know, uh, essentially uh, 500 years of, of disasters on, uh, in this continent. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that Westphalian gave us the national state the sovereign state that is called France, uh, then Germany much later on, then Spain, Italy, uh, Great Britain. And for a long time, we thought that those were the agents. Think in terms of chess. Those are the pieces on the board. And all we need to solve any problem is either those pieces or an agreement among those pieces. However, that agreement was based on a fundamental assumption. One, these are the only agents on the uh, chessboard. Today, we have things not post Bretton Woods, we have things like the, the, the World uh, Economic Forum, the uh, European uh, Bank. We have the European Union well, for a while, at least on this side of the uh, channel. We'll see. Um, so we have transnational, multinational, international agency that are playing a huge role. How we design this, we don't quite know. But also, we have lost a fundamental point, and that's the blue side corresponding there. The right to be forgotten, that is a simple case where we have detached law from geography. They have been hand in hand for almost 500 years. Remember, my place, my rules, your place, your rules. And now Google says, well, yes, your place, your rules, dear France, so I'm going to remove the links from any French version, a European version of the search engine, but not from Google.com. What's your problem? And then of course the problem is that, well, if you remove those links, any kid will just search that in one click away. And Google says, yeah, that's, what's, well, that's not my problem. That's California for you. Well, no, but this is a different space. So all of a sudden, you have that geographical space and cyberspace are not overlapping. This is something we don't know how to solve. We have a post-Westphalian, post-Bretton Wood system that we need to solve. 
this is a foundational crisis uh, of the enlightenment sort of uh, human rights, or oh, big words, but well, well, bear with me. Uh, what are the fundamental rights that we find in the human declaration? Things like, uh, for example, uh, security, privacy, and freedom of speech. And then you realize that these are three, there are many others. In fact, we could actually start sort of forecasting the new crisis coming around the corner. These are three friends they never met. All of a sudden, the information society has organized the party when you organize the three friends. And you just realize that they don't get along. They never did, but we didn't know. We had this sort of uh, Greek architecture where, say, security, privacy, and freedom of speech, where three columns sustain the whole temple. Beautiful, totally unrealistic. Um, in this case, for example, the FBI, FBI Apple uh, sort of case is a clear signal that on the one hand, no, security, and on the other, privacy, they can be in conflict. But the right to be forgotten is another case where, again, privacy and freedom of speech come into conflict. These are two small sort of uh, sparks. Their fire is way bigger, but we need to focus on case by case, you know, to understand that. We, we, knew, we need a new infraethics, a new infrastructure where ethics is facilitated uh, one way or another. Say, so, oh, what do you mean by this? Well, well, for example, the European Data Protection Regulation coming soon, very soon. It could be weeks, it could be months, it won't be years. It's around the corner. And uh, I'm one of the six members of the European uh, Ethics Advisory Group that has uh, been charged with the task of setting up the ethical interpretation of the new EDPR. Why? Well, because uh, we need that sort of infrastructure to make sure that a law goes in the right direction. Do we have it? We don't. Uh, is that something entirely new? Well, pretty much. So things can change quite dramatically. And the last corner, uh, top left. What's the human project here? You know, you ask any politician around the corner and he will say, well, we need to put petrol in the car. You say, yes, yes, absolutely, that's necessary. Where are we going? Uh, no, oh, petrol in the car. So uh, inflation, oh, it has to go down. Uh, jobs, no, they have to, have to go up. Security, total, uh, and so on. You say, yes, yes, absolutely, we, we need to do this. Uh, what for? So we need more of that. I understand, but what's the, what's the long-term human project here? Where are we planning things for the next 100 years? Not for tomorrow, not for the next election. And your standard politician won't have an answer uh, because he's not trained, she's not trained for that particular game. Things in terms of the next election, the problem now, the necessary conditions. A simple example here is internet.org. Oh, someone will step in and will have a human project. Cognitive for everybody. Well, my way, Facebook way, with that particular interface. Do we really want to leave the human project, whatever it's going to be, in the hands of someone else, or is society and other uh, entities that need to have uh, a serious say? Well, these are all issues that uh, we are seeing under our eyes. But as I said, um, I don't want to take too much time, and this thing doesn't tell me the time either. So I need to make sure that I don't overstep. We're doing fine. You're We're doing fine. Because uh, this was the end of the simple stuff. So I hope there was a bit of material. Uh, but this is what uh, comes out of the kitchen. What does it look like when we try to cook it? Um, so I want to move step by step behind you know, the, the door and see how we do a bit of ethics on this. And I said, we could pick up anything of this. And for a moment, I actually asked my wife and I said, maybe uh, should I, no, she's the head of a psychology department back in Oxford. And and uh, the real brain in the house. She's a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I said, well, what, what should I do? And should I talk about um, the right to be forgotten? She said, no, the right to be forgotten. No, not again. Like, uh, I said, oh, man. I said, nobody wants to hear about the right to be forgotten. So I said, okay, fine. Let, let's eliminate the right to, be, right to be forgotten. I've done that too many times. I wanted to show you something going on in the kitchen that is also new for me, not just for you. So. I won't mention the right to be forgotten, the Google Advisory Board, what we did there, but I'm happy to answer questions if you have some curiosity there. I want to show you something else, and I'll start gentle, so that you know, normally that's the way philosophy works. You start biting in, and then slowly, 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 next thing you know, you've been fished. Um, so these are the three que uh, ethical questions that every undergrad, first week, first term, Oxford, uh, will ask. Who should I be? What should I do? Why should I do it? Notice that normally your uh, bright Oxford undergraduate uh, will normally focus on the last one. 
And why should I do it? Why should I do it? Convince me that I don't have to kill everybody with a Kalashnikov. Why is it wrong? And you have to explain that if you really had that question in mind, there's nothing I can say. Because normally, no, when you grow up, it's the second question that bothers you more and more and more. What's the right thing to do? Just tell me, and I'll do it. Should I or should I not divorce? Yeah, because, you know, there are two kids, and is that the right thing to do? Oh, is this the right kind of job uh, for me? Do I really, uh, what's the right thing to do? Because I am willing to do it. So it presupposes a, a moral attitude that gets satisfied by information. But suppose that those are the three questions. So one, a uh, bit of philosophical jargon, one is self poetic it's about you constructing yourself. And that's typical of Greek philosophy. That's called virtue ethics, and it will tell you, you know, who you should be and how you build yourself as almost like a healthy organism. The second one is substantive. It tells you, you know, okay, well, that's, that's the stuff that you, that you have to do in that and, and such and such circumstance. And the third one is motivational, normally either a carrot or a stick. The strength, think in terms of engine, comes from the should. It's not just a description, it's what ought to happen. It's the way the world should actually move uh, uh, if things were done properly. And finally, in what direction? Is there who? Me, 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 uh, because I'm worth it all the time. Uh, is the what, uh, the kind of information that, or the why? So you got a little bit uh, in those three questions the essence of the uh, initial step for uh, an understanding of ethics. Now, good old days, for a long time, uh, the ultimate source of answers to all this was somehow divine. Now you might think, oh, no, really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Even today, I mean, most of this, whatever we have, comes from that tradition. So you may not know that you are speaking <coughs> prose, just to no, quote Moliere, but you are. You may not know, I may not know that I'm no, come from a Christian tradition, but I am. And I'll show you why in a moment. For example, the whole thing is framed in terms of judgment and punishment. Not a Greek view, but a Christian view. Which is fine, uh, it's just as long as we know what we're doing, in terms of who should I be, otherwise, you know, comes the last day, now, am I going to be on the right side of the divide? Uh, what should I do? Again, comes the last day, where am I going to end up? And why should I do it? Uh, well, punishment or reward. This brings with it a beautiful thing that only you know, this civilization, post-Christian civilization, has ever had. Ethics is a matter of uh, fair rules and trial and intelligibility. And this is so obvious to everyone, they think, yeah, I mean, of course, of course, nada. No. Uh, ethics could be a nasty game where the rules are unfair, uh, it's totally unintelligible, and the trial is bias. Uh, welcome no, to the Greek world of tragedy. You know, does the poor hero in a tragedy have any responsibility? No, it's totally unfair, and well, so be it. And of course, ethics is grounded in some kind of law. You, know, uh, you still find people thinking in terms of the Ten Commandments in computer ethics. Really? Seriously? Well, that's the tradition in which we have grown up. And of course, it's theocentric. Now, this is important in order to understand what's happening today. If you remove, not from your philosophy, but from the background from which you're doing your philosophy, if you really remove a divine source, what happens to all these things? Well, first of all, ethics is not grounded in, uh, in law, it's vice versa. And in any lay society, that's what we have, is ethics that constrains law, not the other way around. And that's pretty uh, fine. And of course, it's not theocentric. Uh, law grounding in ethics, we talk about an anthropocentric ethics based on human values, human evaluations. The thought starts being that if you weren't for humans in the universe, there wouldn't be no ethics. You know, remove humans from the world, keep God there, and there's still ethical stuff going on. Remove God, remove the humans, well, the world is essentially neutral, uh, has got no value in and of itself. Not a view that we have in some corners of applied uh, ethics these days. So suppose the ultimate source of uh, answers is humanity to those three questions. Well, ICETs, that's my suggestion, invite us to reconsider uh, that ethical framework. So we move from the divine to the anthropocentric. We can move from a system-oriented, not for the right context, or, forgive me for the no, jargon, ontocentric, or based on reality kind of perspective. This comes from medical ethics from bioethics, from feminist ethics, from ethics that look at the receiver of the action as framing the whole ethical discourse as opposed to the agent. Now, to do that, 
a simple model. Suppose that all the ethical actions we ever have in our life are just a matter of sending a message. The message could be actually a stabbing in the back. No. But uh, there's an agent that sends the action, uh, activates the action. I mean, for the computer scientist, this sounds way more intuitive than for some of us. And there's a receiver, a patient, that uh, is on the other side. Of course, things uh, get more complicated because the patient will react, there's feedback, there's interaction. But let's keep it as you know, elementary at the brick level to construct the rest. In this context, there may not be judgment and punishment. This is too strict. This is all about responsibility. But there's a lot that goes on in uh, terms of uh, other agents, more mixed agents, uh, strange agents that are a bit humans, uh, a bit uh, artificial. Uh, a tank with five soldiers in it. That's a whole agent moving around. A political party, that's also an agent. Institutional uh, agents, agents like, like a whole company. Now they can be sources of moral actions, as in they may go and do things in the world that can either be good or bad for the world, but you don't really find that responsibility immediately attached to that. Now the, the little software, piece of software that made a mess uh, and ended up by so creating a clash between two different programs in the hospital and uh, ended up by having the patient dead. Well, surely you don't want to make that little piece of software responsible. Someone else will be behind that. But accountable, as in where the chain of cause and effect ends up, well, that's, that should be possible. So we need to expand our sense of agency and include more. How precisely and where to stop? Well, that's what we need to do uh, as new work. We haven't done it in the past. We need also to include more patients, more things and uh, entities on the receiving side. As long as we were just the only people in town, as it were, to play ethics, well, this was an overlapping. Now, those who can act ethically can also be you know, on the receiving side of ethical actions and vice versa. But today, for example, trivially, we think that uh, animals can be affected ethically. We don't expect them to behave ethically towards us. We expect, for example, uh, say in, the, in terms of UNESCO, to respect uh, world heritage places in an ethical sense. We do that for a number of reasons, including uh, human values, but we do that for the sake of that monument, for example, or that language, which is disappearing. That's UNESCO for you as well. Those are on the receiving side. They don't necessarily play an active role as agents. So we need to expand that too. So once we are doing all this, and uh, no, the, the ultimate source uh, is uh, still humanity, we have accountability for artificial agents and we need to understand exactly what that means. We have a regained sense of the tragic, that's information without power. So um, if you have all, if you know exactly what's gonna happen, but you have no way of changing the course of, of things, in which happens more and more in a mass media society like ours, you know, bombarded by information, that is tragic. That is the sense of uh, powerless, informed uh, side. You would like to do the right thing, you know exactly what should be done, you can't do it. In other words, you leave the town in order to avoid uh, killing your father and marrying your mother, and on the way to the other town, you meet that guy and kill that guy. And the other town, oh, there's a queen who needs a husband, and all of a sudden, you marry that queen. And that is tragic for anyone who can think of that sort of uh, scenario. And yet, no, the poor guy no, had all the information in, in hands. We also need to do much more in terms of design. This is, if anything, is the age of design. Uh, we went through uh, stages where it was the age of discoveries and the age of invention. Well, welcome to the age of design where we have a lot to put together in a smart way, where of course inventing and discovering is essential, but how you construct all that is quintessentially our age. It doesn't matter if it is produced in China, as long as it's designed in California, that is the crucial bit. So once again, what does it mean to design here things? Well, it means to have that sense of infrastructure where you don't do the ethics, you put all the pipes in place so that the ethics circulates in the right way. And uh, more on this in a moment. And of course, we want to shift our attention from being so obsessed with only humans to being also careful about the rest of the environment. We moved wonderful steps forward in the last few sort of centuries Remember when we used to think that the only uh, thing that you should really care about was male Athenian citizen? End of the story. That was the only sort of uh, subject and patient of moral action. 
And then we accepted other things, you know, and entities. You know, we ended up by having women on board, uh, uh, you know, slaves and future generations, and trees and, and valleys and rivers. And today, we just need to make one more step. Anything that is artifactual, anything that is built by humans, that also deserves some respect. Perhaps less, overridable, to be uh, sort of uh, contextualized, but it's inconceivable that in the age of artifacts, we still think in terms of the only thing that are sort of re deserve respect are somehow biological. And what about the artificial? That is worth disrespect? I don't think so. Not least because there's the Mona Lisa out there that is totally artificial. So this is the picture you get from all I've said so far. And again, it's a, a bit too far away from some of you, but uh, uh, still looking at the time just in case um, I'm overstepping, but uh, I can uh, uh, summarize things rather quickly. If you look at number five on the uh, left-hand side, uh, this is just trivial Venn diagrams for beginners. So, and those are the, the only ways you can combine those, those circles. So it covers the whole field. Number five says, oh, there are agents and there are patients or more actions, and they are completely disjoint. In other words, no, anyone who receives an action is never an agent, and anyone who no, uh, so is a source of an action is never a patient. In, uh, to the best, best of my understanding, no philosopher, no matter how crazy philosophers are, has ever argued in favor of that pitch. So it's there just for theoretical reasons. A lot of people have argued, can't include that uh, uh, in the square, the uh, one A equal P, has said, well, Kant is famous for this. In order to be an agent, you have to have intentionality and all the rest. In order to be a patient, you have to have human dignity. Well, bingo, the agents and the patients are the same set. Then uh, we go down, uh, number three, bottom left. And that's Aristotle, for example. There are agents like Aristotle's God who can do things to the world, but they're not affected by the world. They could not care less. Now, I wasn't no, educated in that particular tradition. I was told uh, as a former Catholic, I'm no longer Catholic, that when you did something wrong, the poor Virgin Mary would cry. So she would be affected. Uh, well, I've you know, stepped out of that particular belief. Um, but So that would not be consistent with this. Um, this is a picture where uh, say Aristotle and Spinoza, another great philosopher, join forces. The agent that sort of provides the source of all more actions may not be affected at all as a patient, no, may not receive. The uh, bottom right is a bit insane because, uh, of course, he says that some do, some don't. Uh, it's a bit like uh, having uh, uh, Aristotle's god joining all the other normal gods, the one which drink, have sex, and get in, involved in Trojan wars and so on. So some are affected, some are not. The thing that we have seen in the past kind of 50 years, and I'm oversimplifying here, is the one with the arrow. We think that we have expanded the number of agents. Now, who can be a source of moral action? After all, we do, for example, speak about the markets being nasty. Uh, no, there's a lot of agents out there. It's not Peter, it's not John, it's not Mary, it's not Alice. But we also have expanded the set of patients. Now we include almost anything there that is biologically uh, sort of constituted. I'm suggesting that we need to go further and do exactly no, more of that work. If we do that, back to the questions, what happens? See, I didn't say anything about that I there that was so dominant. I said something about the who and the should, and the what and the should, the why and the should. But what about the I? Well, the I has been uh, essentially the history of ethics for a long time. Uh, it's, a, it's a teenager attitude. It's about me. The universe is about me. And what should I do? Who should I be? Uh, why should I do it? So it's agent oriented. But the last decades, and computer ethics and information ethics are on that trajectory, have told us or are teaching us that actually, if you put at the center of the moral action, or what is right and wrong, the receiver, and it's the receiver that is suggesting, as it were, dictating what's right and wrong, then you have environmental ethics, medical ethics, uh, feminist ethics, bioethics, where is the thing that is affected that is determining, as it were, what the other agents around the entity are supposed or are not supposed to do. So if the ultimate source of answers is reality, it's not God, it's not, uh, uh, it's not humanity, it's the stuff in itself. There's something good for that stuff and something bad for that stuff. Think in terms of gardening. 
you are the gardener and the garden is there. There's something good for the garden that forces you to do certain kind of things, not vice versa. Any gardener who forces the garden to be in a certain way is not a good gardener like myself. Now, until you listen to what the flowers want, more or less, metaphorically. Uh, that's how you know, we have a conversation in the house with, with my mom sometimes. Um, so um, we need to have a patient-oriented uh, normative approach, which means that, and uh, I'm still looking at the time with uh, Andrew, we can step into something that's lighting different. Five more minutes. Sorry. And this is the last thing I want to leave you with and then uh, uh, wrap up. For the computer scientists, this is a, 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 a little game. For those of us who have never seen it before, maybe it's slightly confusing, so I'll show you a picture in a moment. This is a very elementary finite state automaton. It's week one, computation, course for beginners, etc. So. It's what, for example, regulates an automatic door. It closes and opens depending on what state it is in and what input it gets. Let me give you the picture because it's much easier. So the picture um, uh, here indicates, suppose you are Suppose you are on the left-hand side in state 1. The uh, little uh, table on top tells you what happens if you are in state 1 and do action B. If you are in state 1 and do action B, you stay in state 1. If you are in state 1 and you do action A, you move to S2, the second state. At that point, you're there in S2. What happens if you do action A again? Well, you look at S2, action A, it's a little bit like a, a, a little map, and you move to S3. So in other words, you have states, you have rules to move through states, and you have a number of states finite and a number of rules finite. It's a very simple game. The door is closed, you pass, the door opens. The door is already open, you keep passing, stays open. That's the kind of elementary game we have here. Why it is useful? Well, this is a, uh, it's just a little scheme. So uh, I've had discussions with computer scientists and logicians. They say, oh, we can model this. That's not the point. This is a sandpit kind of thing. Don't model it. This is it's a joke. It's a good joke. It's a joke because uh, what we can do with this is to start thinking in terms of the system we want to modify. The system changes. It changes according to rules. Where do we have an input to make a difference to the system? Remember, a few steps back. It's not God, it's not humanity, it's about the system. It's about reality. Okay, reality changes. Yes, it does. Suppose we find a very elementary, stupid little game. If we don't master this, surely we can't master anything else. So, it's stupid enough. If this is too problematic, well, let's stop and think, because, of course, anything else is going to be more challenging. Here, simple rules state transitions. What can we do to change these uh, state transitions uh, things? Well, remember I told you, we want to see what was happening in the kitchen. No, that's what happens when you have, get a dish, this nasty stuff. Well, first of all, uh, we can have a look at the agents. Well, you want to make a difference to that particular system called, say, society? Look at the agent. Educate the agents. Or, for example, put responsibility on the shoulders of the agents. Uh, you don't want to have um, age 13 people on Facebook empower the users. Good trick. Yes, yes you can. And uh, we've been doing this since the Greeks. That's called virtue ethics. And in virtue ethics you have this beautiful correspondence between the little agent and the big agent. The, the micro uh, and the macro. Which means that if you read Plato's Republic, you have the correspondence between the citizen and the Republic. What's wrong with that? It doesn't scale. Unfortunately, it is impossible to make a difference to uh, a system that is regulated by the interactions of millions of people. It, of course, it helps to have virtuous agents, but it doesn't scale up too nicely. And more on this in other contexts. So, yes, maybe we can look at the agents. In the previous metaphor, um, a way of the time, we'll come uh, close to that. In the kitchen metaphor, you start thinking, okay, well, what I really want to have is a great cook, or not. Or maybe you don't care whether it's a great cook or not. All you care about is the cooking. Whoever is doing it. Maybe it's a robot. Who cares? I mean, or maybe it's a nasty guy. Uh, but as long as, oh, no, no, three people who just accidentally ended up with a fantastic recipe. As long as the cooking is good. So that's the other lesson we can get from, the, from ethics. We concentrate on the actions, their consequences, or in themselves. 
And that's where you get, again, introduction to ethics for beginners. That's uh, uh, Mill and Kant is the utilitarian or uh, consequentialist tradition. Look at the actions, forget about the agents, whatever their motivations are, look at the actions. And either in themselves, Kant, or for their consequences. This does or does not work. But it's not the only way of doing this. Because maybe you don't even care about the cooking, or you care, and we're now coming back to the final end. You cook, a, you care about a dish. Maybe the cook is crook, and the cooking is accidental, but the dish is delicious. Whatever way they did it, it maybe it was a mistake. Or maybe they want to create something really nasty and it ended up by something delicious. As long as it's delicious, do you really mind about the agents and the actions? But remember, this is the shift from, from God to humanity to the world. If the, goal, the world goes better, do you really care whether the actions have been motivated by selfish, you know, business-oriented interests or not, or no voluntary wonderful actions? And whether the agents are nasty beasts, devils, damn, or, or, or angels? I couldn't care less. If the world gets better, bring it in. Right. So that's good. We have a system state. And that's the kind of uh, uh, sort of work that I uh, illustrated a moment ago. You can be more environmentally oriented for whatever reasons in terms of actions or, or agents, and you can be ontocentric. So I'll stop here because uh, uh, with this last uh, point, because I think we, I would like to leave some uh, time for Q&A. The last point I want to make here is the following. You now have a glimpse uh, and a, just a, a little taste of a distinction that we need to explore, a distinction that we haven't made in the past. And it's not because we were stupid, but because the world changes. And of course, now we are building things on their shoulders. So of course, we can see further away. Now, Newton was right, even if he was from Cambridge. I mean, so uh, the view is that so far, we have always dealt with ethics as if we were the same thing in terms of infra-ethics. Thinking in terms of uh, water and pipes. We've been discussing kind of water and pipe at the same time as a block. But one thing is to decide what values you want to implement. In other words, it's one thing to decide which are the red states and which are the green states and which are the blue states. The green is, you don't want it. The green is what you want. The blue are the transition state. This is called in uh, no, philosophy, the axiological analysis. What's good? It's like being a garden and deciding, well, what's good for this particular sort of uh, uh, bed of roses? Then there is, how do I bring that about? In other words, where do I put pressure on the agents, the actions, or uh, the system? And how do I achieve that particular value? How do I bring that value to be implemented? And that's the infrastructure that leads to that. Now, I said I was... Uh, Closing with this, but think in terms of uh, the last concept that we've been discussing uh, in the last few years. The rule of law, privacy, security, these are issues that do not really belong to ethics, strictly speaking. Privacy, for example, is not necessarily a value, and trust is not necessarily a value either. You have high degrees of trust between two serial killers who decide to kill more people. Now, if anything, you know, terrorist cells, they have a high degree of, tr of trust and a high degree of privacy. So, but that's not what I meant. No, that's exactly what we mean. But that's why privacy and trust, for example, they belong to the infra -ethics. Those are the pipes. But if the pipes are then conveying you know, rubbish or poisonous stuff or the purest of water, well, that's the other side of the discussion. So let's not get confused between the infra -ethics, the pipes, and what we are actually conveying. Now, I said I was going to stop here, and I shall, but you can see that there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and a lot of bright, new, entirely exciting work that needs to be done for our society. So thanks for your attention, and I think we can have a bit of time for Q&A. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Luciano. An awful lot to think about. When it comes to questions, there's the questions from people here, but also we're connected to cyberspace because the team at the back is not only recording but connected with um, uh, live listeners. I do need a little bit of help to get the, the live questions up, please. But um, in the meantime, um, if people from the floor have questions, something I wanted to... Um, to ask you myself is I'm very interested in you know your modern interpretation of 
the two cultures. I guess this is you know, referring to CP Snow. It used to be science and arts, but now it's um, um, syntax versus semantics and you know, m meaning versus mechanics. I mean, you know, how, how do you sort of view this divide? Is this something we need to be kind of wary of and aware of, and is it something we need to do something about? I think, I think we, it's, a, it's a divide that is a kind of overlap uh, overlaps with the old divide, you know, uh, sort of the, the, the uh, science of, uh, of, of um, humanity and uh, arts versus the hard sciences, the mathematical ones, the, the, the empirical ones. And if that was a mistake, uh, then the good news is that this is, a, is an early mistake we can still avoid. In other words, that mistake was realized too late even in terms of organizing the, 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 the structure of, of, of a faculty, of a university. Today, we're seeing this sort of polarization of interests to say, oh, no, no, but I do only with the maths. I only do with the, with the social science. I do only with the ethics, but I don't do uh, the sort of machine learning. I think this is a time where, precisely because it's early days, we can still make sure that this gap doesn't become no, uh, unbridgeable. Uh, past experience shows that we make mistakes first and then we find solutions. So I'm uh, just mildly optimistic about being able to avoid that particular gap. Well, I expect, you know, we come from opposite sides of that divide. So yeah. I, I look forward to spending a lot more time this, talking this to you. This is the place. Oh, no, I'm saying this because this is the place. Now, the Alan yeah. Turing Institute, the Oxford Institute, this is the, the place where we are not suffering from that particular sort of polarization. But, no, that polarization is happening. So we are the front front in terms of making sure that this sort of uh, uh, unification, you know, multidisciplinary uh, approach uh, stays in place. There are forces out there that would like to see things you know, going in different directions. Uh, I hope not. So while we assemble cyberspace, yes, question from the floor. Hi, there are plenty of human agents today that would have uh, limited responsibility from an eth ethical and legal point of view. And uh, of course, it has been long argued that ma material objects have certain levels of agency and responsibility as well. Uh, so how do you see algorithms and automation and robotics uh, being different in these kind of uh, limited responsibility moving towards accountability. No. Thank you. So um, I think it's important to have a, a distinction in mind, otherwise um, it's very hard to, to grasp where things stand. So responsibility is about intending to do something. Forget about anything else. At least you have to mean to do that. If you turn on the light and something explodes in the other building, you have no idea. Like, it, 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 you just go turn on the light to see something, and boom, you are not responsible for that. Boom. That's clear to anyone. It was clear since you know, uh, someone said, no, uh, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. And that is crucial. That's what we live through in terms of responsibility. Accountability is another thing. So the accountability, at least in this context, is where you trace the cause and effect all the way back to. And unfortunately, no, the accountable source of that boom is the turning on of that particular light. So one may be accountable for something even if that someone is not responsible for that something. Now when it comes to artificial agents, for example, say a particular uh, uh, smart algorithm that is not that smart and causes a bit of a bias and doesn't give the uh, mortgage to that individual for a mistake. Uh, or no, a meant bias sometimes. Well, where is the responsibility and where is the accountability? The, the accountability, as you were, ends with the source of that so chain of uh, re reactions. Uh, it's an algorithm, so it, uh, it's adaptable, can learn from uh, the environment, can change its own rules, so as a, way, as a block of a uh, piece of software, can adapt, but it doesn't have uh, intention, it doesn't mean to do anything, it doesn't have a particular sort of a, um, plan in mind as we would sort of attribute to our human being. So we can trace the accountability all the way there. When it comes to responsibility, well, the responsibility seems to me behind uh, one step further, further. And that's with the engineers or the people who use it or the people who put in place. So a small example, if I may, uh, looking at the, well, the border between North Korea and South Korea, that's patrolled by robots. When Samsung built, built those robots, they built them totally, 100% autonomous. Shoot on sight. End of the story buy the stuff, they should. And it was the South Korean generals who said, oh, wait, wait a moment, oh, maybe we want to have uh, uh, someone uh, on the loop so that you know, someone has to say, yes, shoot. And that you know, will be a soldier or someone like that. So we don't like this idea that it's totally automatic. 
Well, if you had something totally automatic, the responsibility of implementing that would still have been with the silly humans who would have allowed that to happen. It wouldn't have been the robot's responsibility to shoot anyone. Someone would have made a silly decision. Yes. Microphone coming. Yes. Uh, thanks, Luciano. Uh, presumably they can hear this. Um, I was actually thinking about the eye problem again, but from the point of view of the patient. So in a sense, if I'm constantly online and not quite ever offline, where do we draw the line of what a patient is? How do we even identify what a patient would be in order to start any ethics? Uh, how would we go about identifying, could I be a patient, for instance, online? And how would we identify me as a or the eye as a, as a patient? So normally we have uh, uh, also a different kind of terminology. We, we, we speak of our stakeholders. Uh, well, if you look at the, the, the literal meaning of that, you know, the, the, the holders of the stake, you know, the, essentially those are the people or the things or the entities of whatever out there that is going to be affected by the decisions we're taking. Uh, they have an interest, and that is also very human in terms of uh, sort of vocabulary, but you could think in terms of a, say, a particular um, environment being, quote unquote, a stakeholder in the actions taken uh, by, say, a government decision. So let's distinguish between whether that is the right strategy versus how difficult is it to implement it. Is the right strategy? I never said it was going to be easy. So we need to uh, understand, as humans do better than anything else, who or what is going to be affected by the action we're going to take. Sometimes it's obvious. You, know, you drive too fast on the motorway, and it doesn't take a genius. You know. uh, sometimes it's very difficult. You build a new um, train from here all the way to the north. <laughs> exactly who, how, how far is going to be affected by this? Well, you need a committee, you need people, you need experts. But that's the difficulty in the implement imp implementation as opposed to are we doing the right thing, moving in this direction. I hope that helps. So, yeah. Over here. If the microphone could travel around over here, it is. Hi. I'm interested in your opinion on the ethics of defaults. Uh, ethics of? And defaults, so when you turn a yes. system on, the default settings. So an auto subscription to a service. Um, the, when you close down an app, or you shut down an app and you come back to it, which screen you come back to. Um, so touching on sort of your last points around pro-ethical design and I'm guessing the responsibility of the system designer because it's a, it's a new area. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. This is very new, for example, and uh, it's uh, this huge amount of work that we need to do. And it's not, it's not just uh, sort of blue sky. Uh, it's also blue sky applicable work. Ethics of default or ethics by design or down to the specific applications nudging, for example. Well, you could have uh, systems that start acting in a way that pushes you in a different direction as opposed to that. And nudging is nudging by design. It's not accidental. Now, there are things that nudge us accidentally because you know, someone put them there. Uh, but other things are there for a reason. I mean, the designer of that particular system nudges you towards this rather than that. Now, just a quick comment. Um, apart from saying this is an area that we need to explore, uh, because it's, it's very sort of opaque at the moment, and we've never been there before. Again, design, remember, is our age that is concerned about that. And we have now the technology to design whole environments, something unprecedented. But apart from that, specifically in terms of nudging or default or uh, so, um, having ethics by design, in another context and not for today, I've argued uh, that there is a way of doing that which is at the same time tolerant and paternalistic. You want to be paternalistic in terms of, you no, know, essentially implementing things I know better than, you know, say, these kids, what is good for these kids, and therefore let me put a tax on those uh, you know, uh, excessive sugar because uh, they need to stop drinking all that stuff. But you can also be tolerant by saying a bit of a tax. In other words, if you really like that Coke, go for it. It's just that I make it slightly more difficult for you or for you know, Peter and Mary and so on to have that kind of uh, enjoyable drink. So there's a, a fine line which we need to identify case by case where a toleration towards human choices and paternalism in terms of knowing better and therefore telling people what is better for them uh, go hand in hand. Medi medical ethics here has now made enormous steps forward, uh, as you may imagine. Yeah.
outside of the real world, um, if you wanted to retain human thought, is it best to do nothing? Can you tell me more? Sorry. Um, I mean, if we didn't have to do action and we weren't a patient, is that a scenario that would allow the retention of human thought? Okay. Um, I'm not sure I entirely grasp the point, but uh, so correct me if I got you wrong. Um, inaction, unfortunately, is action. Not doing something is a way of doing something. Uh, that's because uh, normally life comes with deadlines. Uh, in other words, if you don't do it, if you don't do it, something will happen anyway. So uh, there's a lot of inaction that, you now say, uh, about the environment, that is hugely morally loaded. Not doing anything, it doesn't mean that I can step out of the ethical game. So unfortunately, ethics is one of those things that either you like it or not, you're always playing that game. There is no uh, 25th hour, 8th day when you can step out and on holiday. 24-7 is always ethics anyway. So I, I'm not sure whether I address your point entirely, but I'm afraid that uh, there is no way of stepping out of that. So we may as well play attack rather than defense, because defense is still a way of playing. I'm interested in labels and I'm talking about the divide between data and information. Because I'm looking at something that says data science and I've been practicing as an information scientist for 35 years. And one of the problems is that word science implies a controlled environment if you do this then this. And I think we're much more towards the classic wicked problem situation of VIT in the, in the 1970s, of where actually we're dealing with such a set of interdependencies that we have to rethink whether, in fact, is it a science with a theory or a proof and whatever, or actually are we making a mistake in labeling the area we're working in as a science? Because people then think there will be a scientific solution. <laughs> and what we're hearing here is that we're very far from that. Yeah, a good point. Uh, I think that whether there is such thing as data science or not, uh, we will know in a few decades. Uh, it may go down. Oh, seriously, I mean, it will. It, will, it, will, it may go down like uh, cybernetics. It didn't. It didn't take. I mean, wonderful, but all complexity. I mean, we have only one institute, the Santa Fe. Cybernetics is not a department almost anywhere in the world. If it is, you should be suspicious. Uh, so essentially, you know, great ideas, great sort of. Um, uh, bundles of, of uh, methodologies, uh, suggestions, money, lots of money too. It just didn't take. But we could also go down the, 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 the biochemical route. And now any respectable university in the world has a biochemistry you know, department. Uh, you would think, oh, two different disciplines, what would they have to Well, they found the area where essentially they have to have that multidisciplinary so interactions uh, at stake. Now, I'm not sure I entirely you know, sort of share your view about what science is and isn't in terms of control. I think that uh, we've been, no, that's the, as it were, vulgata. That's what we tell the world is science. But when we do science, I mean, <laughs> the lab is always dirty. No, the data are always not quite right. And the control, you have to bring someone else. And then you throw everything well. So, I mean, unfortunately, science. Yeah, the perception, oh, exactly. So I think that uh, we can definitely build a narrative or perception for, to the outside world where data science is as polished, clean, like a diamond, and uh, as any other data uh, science in the world. Whether that is going to uh, pick up roots or not, I think that uh, we need to decide uh, at some point whether the world needs it or not. And my, no, the reason why I'm here, the reason why we're having this uh, sort of uh, conferences, the incident, is because, of course, I am of the view that there will be, and that it is fundamental, and it's one of the new sciences that we will see developing in the future. Maybe the title will change, maybe we'll call it something else, but it won't be called statistics, and it won't be called uh, computer science. Data science seems as good as anything else we have at the moment. There is a need for that in the world. I believe that it will take roots uh, in the medium term, but maybe we can have this conversation about 10 years. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's a wonderfully optimistic uh, note to end on and even more optimistic there's some um, tea and coffee outside and Thank you more of a chance to Thank to you. ask Luciano about the things we didn't get around to asking like I, I, I think we should ask him about the right to be forgotten he you know, dropped a very large <laughs> I got away with that he, uh, <laughs> he didn't take it 
Um, so thank you, Luciano, for a, a, a wonderful lecture. Thank you.